world premiere. I think I would have rather not lived to find out what I have today. Oh, Pioneers, Sunday. This is CBS. I've got a solution to the trade deficit. Sure you do. Well, why buy an import when Chevy has 2.9% financing on Cavalier? I have no interest in low interest. You're right. How about uh, saving 1500 bucks? That much? Compare these examples of a $10,000, 48-month loan. With 2.9, you'd save over $1,500 in interest plus other savings. 2.9? How interesting. Hurry to your central eye with Chevy dealer for 2.9% financing on Cavalier, but only through February 4th. Coming up tonight on TV8 News, live at 10, making ends meet. I'm Liz Murdy, and nowhere has the recession affected Iowans more than at the supermarket. Groceries are costing you $100 a month more than they did six years ago, and that's for a family with two young children. Tonight, we'll meet a working mother who shares her frustrations when it comes to grocery shopping, and we'll show you how you can save almost $900 a year at the checkout aisle. Tonight at 10 on TV8, Iowa's news leader. Making ends meet at town meeting Thursday, January 30th at 7. This is a CBS News special report. State of the Union, 1992. From CBS News headquarters in New York, here is Dan Rather. Good evening, everybody. As we begin, what we hope you will find an innovative, interesting, and complete broadcast coverage of the State of the Union Address. President Bush will be introduced to a joint session of Congress shortly. For weeks, the President has been raising expectations by, among other things, promising that tonight's speech will contain detailed plans for reviving the economy. We'll also be hearing the response from the Democrats. Now, this being an election year, and with so much at stake for the nation, we also want to hear from you tonight. Hundreds of thousands of you in our brand new experimental telephone in response broadcast, America on the Line. We'll tell you all about that a bit later. First, as we wait for President Bush to be introduced into the chamber of the House, let's check in with Bob Schieffer on Capitol Hill. Bob, big game atmosphere and mood there tonight? Well, Dan, there's always a lot of electricity in the air when the president comes up to the Capitol. I know the conventional wisdom is that there's been so much advance hype about this speech that the president can't possibly uh, meet the expectations. But the fact is, uh, they released uh, advanced copies of the speech a while ago, and there is a considerable meat in this speech. There's uh, the usual election year goodies. He's going to increase the exemption, uh, tax exemption, for children who, people who have children. But he also announces some major changes in the American strategic arsenal. So there is some meat in this speech. It may not be what uh, some have expected, but it's, it's a fairly substantive speech, I think. Now let's switch over to the White House and our White House correspondent, Susan Spencer. Dan, I guess I would describe the uh, atmosphere here as anticipatory and maybe a little bit nervous. You know, it was a calculated political gamble to let so much ride on just one State of the Union speech. And there are a lot of people inside the White House, and particularly at the Bush campaign, who thought it was a mistake, that the president probably should not put so many of his eggs in one basket. But in any case, uh, he, he has done so, and he should be well prepared. He has brought in advisors, some of whom worked with him in the 1988 presidential campaign. Uh, the speech has been written, rewritten, redrafted. He was rehearsing much of the day. The idea is that he comes across presidential, reassuring, and in control of the economy. Dan? The president is what you're watching and hearing here is the president is in the House chamber and making his way up to where he will speak in front of uh, House Speaker Tom Foley, who will be handling the Democrats' response tonight, and his running mate for 1992. Uh, the president says that he will be keeping Vice President Dan Quayle on the ticket. And Vice President Quayle now getting his handshake from the top of the ticket and the President of the United States, George Bush. After the introduction, of course, there will be uh, more applause. The term State of the Union message came into use in 1941. Before then, these annual messages from the President were generally called, quote, annual messages. But some political consultant at the time thought up the phrase State of the Union message and it stuck. Mrs. Bush, who wore blue last year at the State of the Union, in green this year.
back there. <laughs> Members of the cabinet. Defense Secretary Cheney in the middle. Members of the Congress, I have the high privilege and the distinct honor of presenting to you the President of the United States. And as is kind of tradition, a second standing ovation after the President is introduced. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last year, the State of the Union address, the President said, we'll get this recession behind us and return to growth soon. This being one year later, he's expected to concentrate a bit more on the recession and how he thinks the country can get out of it and go on to an even stronger economy than it's had over the past half century. Secretary of State ba uh, you, Baker Mr. is in Speaker. Moscow. He's the one cabinet secretary not here yet. Mr. Speaker. Mr. President, distinguished members of Congress, honored guests and fellow citizens, thank you very much for that warm reception. You know, with the big buildup this address has had, I, I uh, want to make sure it'd be a big hit, but I couldn't convince Barbara to deliver it for me. <laughs> I, Reverend Dr. Billy Graham at Mrs. Bush's right. I see the speaker and the vice president are laughing. They saw what I did in Japan, and they're just happy they're sitting behind me. I, uh, I, uh, I mean to speak tonight of big things, of big ch changes and the promises they hold and of some big problems and how together we can solve them and move our country forward as the undisputed leader of the age. And we gather, we gather tonight at a dramatic and deeply promising time in our history and in the history of man on earth. For in the past 12 months, the world has known changes of almost biblical proportions. And even now, months after the failed coup that doomed a failed system, I'm not sure we've absorbed the full impact, the full import of what happened. But communism died this year. And And even as president with the most fascinating possible vantage point, there were times when I was so busy managing progress and helping to lead change that I didn't always show the joy that was in my heart. But the biggest thing that has happened in the world, in my life, in our lives, is this. By the grace of God, America won the Cold War. I may mean to speak this evening of the changes that can take place in our country now that we can stop making the sacrifices we had to make when we had an avowed enemy that was a superpower. And now we can look homeward even more and move to set right what needs to be set right. And I will speak of those things, but let me tell you something I've been thinking these past few months. It's a kind of roll call of honor. For the Cold War didn't end, it was won. And I think of those who won it. 
in places like Korea and Vietnam, and some of them didn't come back. And back then they were heroes, but this year they were victors. And the long roll call, all the GI Joes and Janes, all the ones who fought faithfully for freedom, who hit the ground and sucked the dust and knew their share of horror. This may seem frivolous, and I don't mean it so, but it's moving to me how the world saw them. The world saw not only their special valor, but their special style, their rambunctious, optimistic bravery, their do-or-die unity, unhampered by class or race or region. What a group we've put forth for generations now. From the ones who wrote Kilroy was here on the walls of the German stalags to those who left signs in the Iraqi desert that said, I saw Elvis. What a group of kids we've sent out into the world. And there's another to be singled out, though it may seem inelegant. And I mean a mass of people called the American taxpayer. No one ever thinks to thank the people who pay a country's bill or an alliance's bill. But for half a century now, the American people have shouldered the burden and paid taxes that were higher than they would have been to support a defense that was bigger than it would have been if imperial communism had never existed. But it did. Doesn't anymore. And here's a fact I wouldn't mind the world acknowledging. The American taxpayer bore the brunt of the burden and deserves a hunk of the glory. And so now... And so now, for the first time in 35 years, our strategic bombers stand down. No longer are they on round-the-clock alert. Tomorrow, our children will go to school and study history and how plants grow. And they won't have, as my children did, air raid drills in which they crawl under their desks and cover their heads in case of nuclear war. My grandchildren don't have to do that and won't have the bad dreams children had once in decades past. They're still threats, but the long, drawn-out dread is over. A year ago... A year ago tonight, I spoke to you at a moment of high peril. American forces had just unleashed Operation Desert Storm. And after 40 days in the desert skies and four days on the ground, the men and women of America's armed forces and our allies accomplished the goals that I declared and that you endorsed. We liberated Kuwait. And Soon after, the Arab world and Israel sat down to talk seriously and comprehensively about peace and historic first. And soon after that, at Christmas, the last American hostages came home. Our policies were vindicated. <laughs> Much good can come from the prudent use of power. And much good can come of this. A world once divided into two armed camps now recognizes one sole and preeminent power, the United States of America. And, and they regard this with no dread, for the world trusts us with power and the world is right. They trust us to be fair and restrained. They trust us to be on the side of decency. They trust us to do what's right. And I use those words advisedly. A few days after the war began, I received a telegram from Joanne Spiker, 
the wife of the first pilot killed in the Gulf, Lieutenant Commander Scott Spiker. Even in her grief, she wanted me to know that someday, when her children were old enough, she would tell them that their father went away to war because it was the right thing to do. And she said it all. It was the right thing to do. And we did it together. There were honest differences right here in this chamber. But when the war began, you put partisanship aside and we supported our troops. And this is still a time for pride, but this is no time to boast. For problems face us, and we must stand together once again and solve them and not let our country down. <laughs> Two years ago, I began planning cuts in military spending that reflected the changes of the new era. But now, this year, with imperial communism gone, that process can be accelerated. Tonight, I can tell you of dramatic changes in our strategic nuclear force. These are actions we are taking on our own because they are the right thing to do. After completing 20 planes for which we have begun procurement, we will shut down further production of the B-2 bomber. We will, we will cancel the small ICBM program we will cease production of new warheads for our sea-based ballistic missiles. We will stop all new production of the Peacekeeper missile, and we will not purchase any more advanced cruise missiles. This weekend, I will meet at Camp David with Boris Yeltsin of the Russian Federation. I've informed President Yeltsin that if the Commonwealth, the former Soviet Union, will eliminate all land-based multiple warhead ballistic missiles, I will do the following. We will eliminate all peacekeeper missiles. We will reduce the number of warheads on Minuteman missiles to one and reduce the number of warheads on our sea-based missiles by about one-third. And we will convert a substantial portion of our strategic bombers to primarily conventional use. President Yeltsin's early response has been very positive, and I expect our talks at Camp David to be fruitful. I want you to know that for half a century, American presidents have longed to make such decisions and say such words, but even in the midst of celebration, we must keep caution as a friend. For the world is still a dangerous place. Only the dead have seen the end of conflict. And though yesterday's challenges are behind us, tomorrow's are being born. The Secretary of Defense recommended these cuts after consultation with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and I make them with confidence. But do not misunderstand me. The reductions I have approved will save us an additional $50 billion over the next five years. By 1997, we will have cut defense by 30% since I took office. These cuts are deep, and you must know my resolve. This deep and no deeper. <laughs> To do less would be insensible to progress, but to do more would be ignorant of history. We must not go back to the days of the hollow army. We cannot repeat the mistakes made twice in this century when armistice was followed by recklessness and defense was purged as if the world were permanently safe. I remind you this evening that I have asked for your support in funding a program to protect our country from limited nuclear missile attack. We must have this protection because too many people in too many countries have access to nuclear arms. And I... <laughs> and 
And I urge you again to pass the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI. There are those who say that now we can turn away from the, from the world, that we have no special role, no special place. But we are the United States of America, the leader of the West that has become the leader of the world. And as long as I am president, I will continue to lead in support of freedom everywhere, not out of arrogance, not out of altruism, but for the safety and security of our children. Yes. This is a fact. Strength in the pursuit of peace is no vice. Isolationism in the pursuit of security is no virtue. And now to our troubles at home. They're not all economic. The primary problem is our economy. And there's some good signs. Inflation, that thief, is down and interest rates are down but unemployment is too high some industries are in trouble and growth is not what it should be and let me tell you right from the start and right right from the heart I know we're in hard times but I know something else this will not stand My in this chamber in this chamber, we can bring the same courage and sense of common purpose to the economy that we brought to Desert Storm. And we can defeat hard times together. I believe you'll help. One reason is that you're patriots and you want the best for your country. And I believe that in your hearts, you want to put partisanship aside and get the job done because it's the right thing to do. The power of America rests in a stirring but simple idea that people will do great things if only you set them free. Well, we're going to set the economy free, for if this age of miracles and wonders has taught us anything, is that if we can change the world, we can change America. We must encourage investment. We must make it easier for people to invest money and create new products, new industries, and new jobs. And we must clear away the obstacles to growth, high taxes, high regulation, red tape, and yes, wasteful government spending. None of this will happen with the snap of the fingers, but it will happen. And the test of a plan isn't whether it's called new or dazzling. The American people aren't impressed by gimmicks. They're smarter on this score than all of us in this room. The only test of a plan is, is it sound and will it work? We must have a short-term plan to address our immediate needs and heat up the economy. And then we need a longer term plan to keep combustion going and to guarantee our place in the world economy. There are certain things that a president can do without Congress, and I'm going to do them. I have this evening asked major cabinet departments and federal agencies to institute a 90-day moratorium on any new federal regulations that could hinder growth. And In those 90 days, major departments and agencies will carry out a top-to-bottom review of all regulations, old and new, to stop the ones that will hurt growth and speed up those that will help growth. Further, for the untold number of hard-working, responsible Amer American workers and businessmen and women who have been forced to go without needed bank loans, the banking credit crunch must end. And I, and 
I won't neglect my responsibility for sound regulations that serve the public good, but regulatory overkill must be stopped. And And I've instructed our government regulators to stop it. I, I have directed cabinet departments and federal agencies to speed up pro-growth expenditures as quickly as possible. This should put an extra $10 billion into the economy in the next six months. And our new transportation bill provides more than $150 billion for construction and maintenance projects that are vital to our growth and well-being. And that means jobs building roads, jobs building bridges, and jobs building railways. And I have this evening directed the Secretary of the Treasury to change the federal tax withholding tables. With this change, millions of Americans from whom the government withholds more than necessary can now choose to have the government withhold less from their paychecks. Something tells me a number of taxpayers may take us up on this one. This initiative could return about $25 billion back into our economy over the next 12 months. Money people can use to help pay for clothing, college, or to get a new car. And finally, working with the Federal Reserve, we will continue to support monetary policy that keeps both interest rates and inflation down. Now, these are the things I can do. And now, members of Congress, let me tell you what you can do for your country. You must... You must pass the other elements of my plan to meet our economic needs. Everyone knows that investment spurs recovery, and I am proposing this evening a change in the alternative minimum tax and the creation of a new 15% investment tax allowance. This will encourage businesses to accelerate investment and bring people back to work. Real estate has led our economy out of almost all the tough times we've ever had. Once building starts, Carpenters and plumbers work. People buy homes and take out mortgages. My plan would modify the passive loss rule for active real estate developers. <laughs> and it would make it easier for pension plans to purchase real estate. For those Americans who dream of buying a first home, but who can't quite afford it, my plan would allow first-time home buyers to withdraw savings from IRAs without penalty and provide a $5,000 tax credit for the first purchase of that home. And finally, my immediate plan calls on Congress to give crucial help to people who own a home, to everyone who has a business or a farm or a single investment. This time, at this hour, I cannot take no for an answer. You must cut the capital gains tax on the people of our country. Never has an issue been more demagogued by its opponents. But the demagogues are wrong. They are wrong, and they know it. 60% of the people who benefit from lower capital gains have incomes under $50,000. A cut in the capital gains tax increases jobs and helps just about everyone in our country. And
And so I'm asking you to cut the capital gains tax to a maximum of 15.4%. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you, those of you who say, oh no, someone who's comfortable may benefit from that. You kind of remind me of the old definition of the Puritan who couldn't sleep at night, worrying that somehow, someone, somewhere, was out having a good time. <laughs> Opponents of this measure and those who've authored various so-called soak the rich bills that are floating around this chamber should be reminded of something. When they aim at the big guy, they usually hit the little guy. And maybe it's time that stopped. <laughs> this then is my short-term plan. Your, your part, members of Congress, requires enactment of these common sense proposals that will have a strong effect on the economy without breaking the budget agreement and without raising tax rates. And while my plan is being passed and kicking in, we've got to care for those in trouble today. I have provided for up to $4.4 billion in my budget to extend federal unemployment benefits, and I ask for congressional action right away. And I thank the committee. Well, at last. Let's be frank. Let's be frank. Let me level with you. I know, and you know, that my plan is unveiled in a political season. And I know, and you know, that everything I propose will be viewed by some in merely partisan terms. But I ask you to know what is in my heart. And my aim is to increase our nation's good. And I'm doing what I think is right, and I'm proposing what I know will help. I pride myself that I'm a prudent man and I believe that patience is a virtue, but I understand that politics is for some a game and that sometimes the game is to stop all progress and then decry the lack of improvement. But let me tell you, let me tell you, far more important than my political future and far more important than yours is the well-being of our country. And members of this chamber, of this chamber are practical people and I know you won't resent some practical advice when people put their party's fortunes whatever the party whatever side of this aisle before the public good they court defeat not only for their country but for themselves and they will certainly deserve it. and I and I submit my plan tomorrow and I'm asking you to pass it by March 20th and I ask
And I ask the American people to let you know they want this action by March 20th. From the day after that, if it must be, the battle is joined. And you know, when principle is at stake, I relish a good fair fight. And I said, I said my plan has two parts, and it does. And it's the second part that is the heart of the matter. For it's not enough to get an immediate burst. We need long-term improvement in our economic position. We all know that the key to our economic future is to ensure that America continues as the economic leader of the world. We have that in our power. Here then is my long-term plan to guarantee our future. First, trade. We will work to break down the walls that stop world trade. We will work to open markets everywhere. And in our major trade negotiations, I will continue pushing to eliminate tariffs and subsidies that damage America's farmers and workers. And we'll get more good American jobs within our own hemisphere through the North American Free Trade Agreement and through the Enterprise for the Americas Initiative. But changes are here and more are coming. The workplace of the future will demand more highly skilled workers than ever. More people who are computer literate, highly educated. And we must be the world's leader in education. And we must revolutionize America's schools. My America 2000 strategy will help us reach that goal. My plan will give parents more choice, give teachers more flexibility, and help communities create new American schools. 30, 30 states across the nation have established America 2000 programs. Hundreds of cities and towns have joined in. And now, Congress must join this great movement, pass my proposals for new American schools. That was my second long-term proposal, and here's my third. We must make common sense investments that will help us compete long-term in the marketplace. We must encourage research and development. And my plan is to make the R&D tax credit permanent and to provide record levels of support, over $76 billion this year alone, for people who will explore the promise of emerging technologies. And fourth, we must do something about crime and drugs. And it is... And it is time for a major renewed investment in fighting violent street crime. It saps our strength and hurts our faith in our society and in our future together. Surely, a tired woman on, our, on her way to work at six in the morning on a subway deserves the right to get there safely. And, And surely it's true that everyone who changes his or her life because of crime, from those afraid to go out at night to those afraid to walk in the parks they pay for, surely these people have been denied a basic civil right. It is time to restore it. Congress, pass my comprehensive crime bill. It is... It is tough on criminals and supportive of police, and it has been languishing in these hallowed halls for years now. Pass it. Help your country. And fifth, 
I ask you tonight to fund our HOPE housing proposal and to pass my enterprise zone legislation, which will get businesses into the inner city. We must empower the poor with the pride that comes from owning a home, getting a job, becoming a part of things. My plan would encourage real estate construction by extending tax incentives for mortgage revenue bonds and low-income housing. And I ask tonight for record expenditures for the program that helps children born into want move into excellence, Head Start. Step six, we must reform our health care system. For this, for this too bears on whether or not we can compete in the world. American health costs have been exploding. This year, America will spend over $800 billion on health. And that is expected to grow to 1.6 trillion by the end of the decade. We simply cannot afford this. The cost of health care shows up not only in your family budget, but in the price of everything we buy and everything we sell. When health coverage for a fellow on an assembly line costs thousands of dollars, the cost goes into the products he makes and you pay the bill. We must make a choice. Now, some pretend we can have it both ways. They call it play or pay, but that expensive approach is unstable. It will mean higher taxes, fewer jobs, and eventually a system under complete government control. Really, there are, there are only two options, and we can move toward a nationalized system which will restrict patient choice. <laughs> a system which will restrict patient choice in picking a doctor and force the government to ration services arbitrarily. And what we'll get is patients in long lines, indifferent service, and a huge new tax burden. Or we can reform our own private health care system which still gives us, for all its flaws, the best quality health care in the world. Well, <laughs> let's build on our strengths. My plan provides insurance security for all Americans while preserving and increasing the idea of choice. We make basic health insurance affordable for all low-income people not now covered, and we do it by providing a health insurance tax credit of up to $3,750 for each low-income family. And the middle class gets help, too. And by reforming the health insurance market, my plan assures that Americans will have access to basic health insurance even if they change jobs or develop serious health problems. We must bring costs under control, preserve quality, preserve choice, and reduce the people's nagging daily worry about health insurance. My plan, the details of which I'll announce very shortly, does just that. And seventh, we must get the federal deficit under control. I We now have in law enforceable spending caps and a requirement that we pay for the programs we create. There are those in Congress who would ease that discipline now, but I cannot let them do it, and I won't. My, my plan would freeze all domestic discretionary budget authority, which means no more next year than this year. And I, 
I will not tamper with Social Security. But I would put real caps on the growth of uncontrolled spending. And I would also freeze federal domestic government employment. And, and with the help of Congress, my plan will get rid of 246 programs that don't deserve federal funding. Some of them, some of them have noble titles, but none of them is indispensable. We can get rid of each and every one of them. You know, it's time we rediscovered a home truth the American people have never forgotten. This government is too big and spends too much. And I call upon Congress to adopt a measure that will help put an end to the annual ritual of filling the budget with pork barrel appropriations. Every year, the press has a field day making fun of outrageous examples. Lawrence Welk Museum, research grant for Belgian endive. We all know how these things get into the budget. And maybe you need someone to help you say no. And I know how to say it, and I know what I need to make it stick. Give me the same thing 43 governors have, the line item veto, and let me help you control spending. Must put an end to unfinanced federal government mandates. These are the requirements Congress puts on our cities, counties, and states without supplying the money. And if Congress passes a mandate, it should be forced to pay for it and balance the costs with savings elsewhere. After all, a mandate just increases someone else's burden. And that means higher taxes at the state and local level. Step eight, Congress should enact the bold reform proposals that are still awaiting congressional action. Bank reform, civil justice reform, tort reform, and my national energy strategy. And finally, we must strengthen the family because it is the family that has the greatest bearing on our future. When, when Barbara holds an AIDS baby in her arms and reads to children, she's saying to every person in this country, family matters. And I'm announcing tonight a new commission on America's urban families. I've asked M Missouri's governor, John Ashcroft, to be chairman, uh, former Dallas mayor Annette Strauss to be co-chair. You know, I had mayors, the leading mayors from the League of Cities in the other day at the White House, and they told me something striking. They said that every one of them, Republican or Democrat, agreed on one thing, that the major cause of the problems of the cities is the dissolution of the family. And they asked for this commission, and they were right to ask, because it's time to determine what we can do to keep families together, strong and sound. And there's one thing we can do right away. Ease the burden of rearing a child. I ask you tonight to raise the personal exemption by $500 per child for every family. <laughs> uh, 
For a family with four kids, that's an increase of $2,000. And this, this is a good start in the right direction, and it's what we can afford. It's time to allow families to deduct the interest they pay on student loans. And I'm asking you to do just that, and I'm asking you to allow people to use money from their IRAs to pay medical and education expenses, all without penalties. And I'm asking for more. Ask American parents what they dislike about how things are going in our country, and chances are good that pretty soon they'll get to welfare. Americans are the most generous people on earth. But we have to go back to the insight of Franklin Roosevelt, who, when he spoke of what became the welfare program, warned that it must not become a narcotic and a subtle destroyer of the spirit. Welfare was never meant to be a lifestyle. It was never meant to be a habit. It was never supposed to be passed from generation to generation like a legacy. It's time to replace the assumptions of the welfare state and help reform the welfare system. States throughout the country are beginning to operate with new assumptions that when able-bodied people receive government assistance, they have responsibilities to the taxpayer, a responsibility to seek work, education, or job training, a responsibility to get their lives in order, a responsibility to hold their families together and refrain from having children out of wedlock and a responsibility to obey the law. We are going to help this movement. Often, state reform requires waiving certain federal regulations. I will act to make that process easier and quicker for every state that asks for our help. And I want to add, as we make these changes, we work together to improve this system, that our intention is not scapegoating or finger-pointing. If you read the papers or watch TV, you know there's been a rise these days in a certain kind of ugliness, racist comments, anti-Semitism, an increased sense of division. Really, this is not us. This is not who we are. And this is not acceptable. So you have my plan for America, and I'm asking for big things, but I believe in my heart you'll do what's right. And you know, it's kind of an American tradition to show a certain skepticism toward our democratic institutions. I myself have sometimes thought the aging process could be delayed if it had to make its way through Congress. But uh, you will... You. you will uh, deliberate and you will discuss, and that is fine. But my friends, the people cannot wait. They need help now. And there's a mood among us. People are worried. There's been talk of decline. Someone even said our workers are lazy and uninspired. And I thought, really? 
You go tell Neil Armstrong, standing on the moon. Tell the men and women who put him there. Tell the American farmer who feeds his country and the world. Tell the men and women of Desert Storm. Moods. Moods come and go, but greatness endures. Ours does. And maybe for a moment, it's good to remember what in the dailiness of our lives we forget. We are still and ever the freest nation on earth, the kindest nation on earth, the strongest nation on earth, and we have always risen to the occasion. And are going to lift this nation out of hard times inch by inch and day by day and those who would stop us had better step aside because I look at hard times and I make this vow this will not stand We move on together, a rising nation, the once and future miracle that is still this night, the hope of the world. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless our beloved country. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. President Bush standing directly now behind one of the teleprompters that helps him with his speech delivery has concluded his State of the Union address. Perhaps the core of the State of the Union address as applied to the economy, keeping in mind that the background of this was a large expectations about what the president was going to propose for the economy is that the president proposed some adjustments in the income tax withholding tables not a broad tax cut for middle-income americans but a change in the withholding tables the biggest tax cut if congress were to approve it would be the cut in the capital gains tax that's tax paid on profits made from the sales of property to a top rate of 15.4 percent. Now, President Bush had been expected to propose, as he has before, cutting the capital gains tax, but it was generally thought that he might propose cutting that top rate down to, say, 19.6 percent. But instead, he proposed cutting to 15.4. This is certain you can bank it and book it to have the Democrats saying the biggest tax cut he proposed would benefit the most the wealthiest people in the United States. President Bush tried to address that in his State of the Union address by saying that he would consider that kind of talk in effect demagoguery. But nonetheless, that may be the fulcrum on which the president's economic policy turns. Certainly, it is one of the major points that would be debated immediately after his leaving the House chamber. The president had a long list of items. Some had been talked about over the last few weeks that he said would help the economy. Up to $10,000 could be withdrawn from individual retirement accounts, our IRAs, without penalty for first-time home purchasers if the president has his way in Congress. All families could deduct the interest they pay on student loans. The president asked for repeal of uh, taxes on such items as large yachts and and airplanes. Well, all of that part of the President's State of the Union address just concluded. When we come back, CBS News Money correspondent Ray Brady joins us to provide more context and analysis of the President's State of the Union speech. There's lots more 
And then later, we want to hear from you, your views, during a new innovative broadcast, America on the Line. So our coverage will continue in a moment. Stay here with us. of the storm, it's only natural to wonder where the future will lead. To people who worry about the winds of change today, we'd like to remind you that no adversity lasts forever. And we'll be there with the strength and resources you can count on. Because at Merrill Lynch, we're bullish on the future. Volkswagen's got big news for car buyers. Payment Protection Plus is here. Buy or lease a new Volkswagen now, and if you incur a layoff during the first three years of your finance contract, we'll cover your car payments. Plus, we'll cover your car insurance payments. And the best part, you never have to pay us back. Up to $500 a month for up to a full year. Payment Protection Plus. Call now. It's revolutionary, and it's only from Volkswagen. Now, in the wake of President Bush's State of the Union address, our CBS News Money correspondent Ray Brickley is standing by with uh, some analysis and context, trying to give some perspective to the address. Ray, a lot of talk before this address about help for middle-income Americans. If the President's proposals get through Congress, a big if, where will most of that help go and from where will it come? Well, one thing that the middle class will get is a uh, change in their withholding on their taxes, so they'll get $300 more this year. That won't help the economy too much, but a fairly good one in there was a $5,000 tax credit for people who want to buy that first house. That's a pretty good break for them, Dan. And what about the capital gains tax? It was a surprise there in the effect that the president asked for such a large cut in capital gains. Yeah, well, you could hear a rumble from Congress on that one, and it just seems to me that was a surprise, that big a cut, and I think the president's going to face a very tough fight to get that one through, Dan. Likely to make the stock market go up? Well, I think the stock market uh, is going to look at this very carefully because one of the things they're worried about is a lot of these things could bring back inflation. So they'll be sitting back watching it, and they'll want to know whether that capital gains tax is really going to go through before they get really excited. Uh, overall effect on the economy, first in the short run, right? Uh, in the short run, probably not too much effect, Dan. In the final analysis, it all depends on whether the president stimulated people enough to spend money. It's right now, it's in the hands of the American people, Dan. Fair or not fair to say that the president continues to bank on at least an uptick in the economy sometime near the halfway mark of this year? Yes, he seems to keep looking for that, Dan, and the way they are pushing, they may get an uptick before Election Day. Ray Brady here in New York with us. Thanks. Now, stay here with us on this broadcast. A little later, we want to hear from hundreds of thousands of you on our special and experimental phone-in broadcast, America on the Line. Straight ahead, the State of the Union as seen by the Democrats. That's when we come back. This is CBS. If you think quality has to be imported, you're sadly mistaken. American built cars not only meet or exceed the imports in quality and value, they also include features like public schools, police and fire protection, health care, social security, and more. Because an American built car generates 15 times as much tax revenue. Think before you buy a new import. You may be trading away more than just a car. This message is brought to you by your Central Iowa Chevy dealers. I hate to travel. I always sit next to the guy who wants to talk to me the whole way. I mean, eventually he starts forming words. I thought maybe if I made better use of my time, I wouldn't have to travel so much. So I got some help from US West. I got the yellow pages, cellular phone, pager. Now I can spend more time doing the things I want to do. Like talk to my girlfriend. Hi, honey, it's Jake. I'm back. I should have called sooner. U.S. West, making the most of your time. An encouraging forecast that's part of the weather tonight at 10. CBS News coverage of the President's State of the Union address continues with a Democratic response. From New York, here again is Dan Rather. 
Welcome back. Consistent with long-standing CBS News policy to present various views on matters of public interest, we now present the State of the Union official response of the Democrats. Speaking for the Democrats tonight, the Speaker of the House, Congressman Tom Foley of Washington State. My fellow Americans, tonight I speak for the Democratic Party, but I also speak for working families and the middle class, for those who worked hard to move ahead but now find themselves falling behind, for so many of strength and spirit and skill who watch with increasing uncertainty as so many of their hopes have been threatened. This should be America's high noon, but instead after winning both the war in the Persian Gulf a year ago, and the historic struggle of the last half century against communism, we face an ominous, persistent recession, which reminds us anew of President Kennedy's warning that this nation cannot be strong abroad if it is weak at home. At home in America today, thousands wait on a frozen morning outside a hotel in Chicago for just a chance to apply for a job, no matter what the work or wages. At home in America today, the largest automaker in the world which once seemed to be the most secure of all corporations, announces that it will have to lay off 75,000 people in order to survive. At home in America today, the average earnings increase of our workers has declined from first in the world to 10th. This year, millions more of our workers find themselves unemployed and their families' health uninsured. Many state governments are slashing education and other services and raising taxes. The nations whose freedom we protected in the past continue to surpass us in high-paying jobs and in the industries of the future. The standard of living of the American people is a first and fundamental measure of the state of the American Union. So the urgent, overriding task of 1992 is to restore growth and jobs, and the great challenge of the 1990s is to reclaim our industrial edge, revive our economic leadership, and make America once more the most prosperous and powerful economy on earth. For too long, we were told to wait, that things would get better on their own. There was even an effort to talk us out of the recession or to tell us that it wasn't really happening at all. But the truth finally became all too painful and all too clear. The supply side trickle down decade of the 1980s finally led to an economy in decline and left us month after month with a national administration, a drift in domestic policy, seemingly without ideas and without apparent commitment or energy to move America ahead. In the midst of this recession, the administration even resisted extending unemployment benefits. Congress had to pass it three times last year before the president would sign it. Today, before the president has sent his message, Congress took action to renew that extension and we now welcome the president's support. For many months, Democrats have set forth an agenda for change. We have proposed a tax cut for a middle class to help lift the consumer demand that fuels our economy. We have demanded policies to bring down the trade barriers that lock American products out of markets from Europe to Asia. We've called for national health insurance to make health care a fundamental right of all Americans. Here, too, we will seek common ground with the president and the Republicans. To achieve all this and more, we will work with him and with them to do what is best for the country. But we will also stand our ground when basic principles are at stake. We will not agree to do the wrong thing simply for the sake of doing something. In short, we seek a fundamental change from the unsuccessful economic policies of the past 12 years. When we say a middle-class tax cut, we mean exactly that. Not more of the tax cuts of the 1980s, which gave most of the benefits to the very few, and left most of our people actually paying more in taxes. We will insist that this time, the benefits must go to working families, not to the privileged. We will insist that a middle-class tax cut be paid for, not by taking money that should go to schools and health care, 
but by calling on the richest of our citizens at long last to pay their fair share. We will oppose any efforts to misuse the present crisis as an excuse to repeat the worst errors of the last decade. Then we sowed the seeds of the recession we are now in. We must not go down that path again. During the past two administrations, there have been consistent efforts to undo government protection of public health and safety. Today, the hurt of the unemployed is no excuse to undermine regulatory rules that protect their families and all of us from pollution, deceptive advertising, unsafe food and medicine, workplace injury and death. This is not a way to create jobs or make American business prosperous. Nor will we accept the kind of capital gains tax cut that will lead largely to accelerated profit taking, not accelerated investment. One can play a lot of games with statistics, but the bottom line is that two thirds of all the money from the administration's capital gains tax cut would go to the richest 1% of taxpayers. Instead, we need targeted incentives to reward companies that build and buy now, that hire instead of laying off. The president said tonight that when you aim at the well-off, you usually hit the little guy. The truth is, for 12 years, they have been promising to help the little guy and then giving all the breaks to the well-off. And it is time that that stopped. As Democrats, our purpose is not just to end this recession, but to begin a new time of economic growth and progress. So we will propose a new commitment to civilian technology and research. For half a century, American weapons were the best in the world. As we enter the new century, America must build the best consumer and industrial products. We will pursue a trade policy that opens markets on equal terms so that when we buy from Europe and Asia, they will be buying from us as well. We will demand far-reaching changes in education and training so that our students will be the first, not the last, among the industrial nations in science and math. And so our workers will have the skills and the chance to compete successfully with anyone, anywhere. We will also fight for fundamental change in the area of health care. Today, millions of Americans have no health insurance at all. And even those who do have no assurance that they are safe. People worry that if they get sick, their coverage will be canceled. Premiums and out-of-pocket costs continue to multiply. Workers who lose their jobs suddenly find their children without health insurance. This issue will be a test of our national character. Few Americans realize that the United States and South Africa are the only economically advanced nations that do not guarantee the health care of their people. We will fight to change that in this Congress and in the next one as long as it takes, because lives and health are at stake, and so is the financial health of America's families. It is not enough to make minor changes, to tinker with the edges while tolerating basic flaws. We want to replace the status quo, not protect it. We want to help the middle class family, not tax its health care benefits. It is time for national health insurance. It is time to cover every American. It is time to control costs. Because otherwise, we will continue to pay more and more for less and less. And soon the burden will break the budgets of middle class families, of business, and of government at every level. Health care is one of the great unfinished tasks of our society. Almost 60 years ago, America decided that people should age with dignity, and we passed Social Security. Now we must decide that families will live with dignity and pass national health insurance. Finally, there are other urgent issues of basic justice that also go to our character as a nation. So we will oppose any effort from any quarter to widen and exploit racial division or lessen our commitment to break down the barriers and at long last fulfill the pledge that millions of us make every day from the schoolhouses of America to the floor of the House of Representatives, that we shall be one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Appeals to race should have no place in our politics or our national life. 
We will stand for another civil right of every American, the civil right to be protected from violence and crime. Election after election, we hear tough talk. This year, we will pass tougher laws. If the president will ask the Republicans in the Senate to stop filibustering the crime bill that has already been passed by the House of Representatives. We will stand and we will fight for a woman's right to choose. If the Supreme Court removes the guarantee of choice from the Constitution of the United States, this Congress will write it into the laws of the United States. We will stand for daycare and family leave so that workers who take time off to help a sick parent or child will no longer risk their jobs. In closing, let me reaffirm our essential resolve, which is to make America work again. For when the economy is wrong, nothing else is right. We cannot undo all the mistakes of the past 12 years in a single year or in a single Congress. The administration has waited a long time to act. Over and over we have said, we can fight this recession, and we will. We can change this nation fundamentally, and we have to. It is true. The Cold War is over. The old world is past. The old ways of thinking and leading will not do. It is time now to turn our attention to our own land and to our own people, to rebuild its economic strength and standard of life, to master the very different challenges of this new era. Only a few times have Americans stood at so decisive a turning point. Now, with all of us working together, let's get this nation moving again. That was Speaker of the House Tom Foley with the Democrats' response to President Bush's State of the Union message. Speaker Foley emphasizing that in the Democrats' view, the capital gains tax cut the president proposed tonight would benefit primarily two-thirds of it would go to the richest one percent of the people in the country. Now, having heard the Democrats' response, we've got a lot more ground to cover here. We want to hear your response. We want to hear what you think about the President's State of the Union address. We invite you to stay tuned right here on this station and tell us what you think about the issues, everything from the economy to education to taxes. And to do that, we come up with what we think is a unique experiment in television, something brand new. It allows hundreds of thousands of you to call us toll free and register your opinions. What do you think? We call the program America on the Line. Connie Chung, Charles Carroll, and I will be back in just a minute or so to begin it in most of the country. Now, this is important if you're watching in the Pacific time zone. We'll see you later on. The program is scheduled for 9 o'clock Pacific time. But we do want you folks in the Pacific time zone to start calling us right now at this number. In the Pacific time zone only, the number to call us beginning right now is 1-800-652-2CBS. 1-800-652-2CBS. That's in the Pacific time zone only. For viewers in the rest of the country, for most of you, we'll give you another, a different, special toll-free telephone number to call at the start of America on the Line coming up almost immediately. So either way, stay here with us. Stan Rather, I'll see you again soon with America on the Line. This is CBS. This baseball fan is America's best hope for gold in speed skating. Dan Jansen's story next. This exclusive Olympic 92 update is brought to you by Pizza Hut. The youngest in a family of nine, 26-year-old speed skater Dan Jansen of West Dallas, Wisconsin, will make his second Olympic appearance come February. A heartbreak kid at the 88 Games in Calgary, Jansen is still the top medal hopeful for the U.S. men's team. He'll reach for gold in the 500 meters at Albertville. What would you say to have Pizza Hut bring you the ultimate cheese pizza? Delivery! Hold on, we're not just talking one or two kinds of cheese. Delivery! We're not even talking three or four. Delivery! Not even five. We're talking six different cheeses in one delicious pizza. Try the new six cheese pizza for an amazing $7.99. A second for just four bucks more. So if you want cheese, all you gotta do is say... Delivery! Pizza Hut, deliver me! And for an even tastier six cheese pizza, don't forget to add lots of your favorite toppings. Making ends meet on TV8. 
Iowa's news leader. I'm mad as hell about the recession. I am a hard worker, and I've always worked and been willing to work. I've never refused work. I just want to work. Oh, I've never seen it this bad around here at, at all, and I've been here for 56 years. I just lost my job about a month ago. I lost my job and lost my house, car, and everything like that. I'm on my way to interview right now. Even with my pension, I couldn't make ends meet. I couldn't run my business the way this country's been run. I'm scared, definitely scared. They feel their lives are on the line. Tonight, you will see some of America's angriest home videos. I'm mad as hell because I was raised in a country where we talked about rights. I always thought having a job was a right. I always thought of having health insurance was a right. And I'm told that's not a right anymore. In a moment, with the help of some extraordinary new technology that we at CBS have never used before, we're going to try and find out what you at home are thinking and feeling about the state of our nation. I said, I'll sweep the floors. I'll bag your groceries. No, I don't want to lose my home. This may look like a room out of Star Wars, but it's a telephone control center where in the next hour, your calls to us, hundreds of thousands of them, will be tracked and monitored across the country. We'll be giving you a special number to call, so stay tuned. America on the Line, a special CBS News presentation with Dan Rather, Connie Chung, and Charles Caront. From New York, here is Dan Rather. Good evening. Good evening, Connie. Good evening, Dan. Well, folks, we're trying one. We're going to try to do something new and different tonight with your help, and I underscore you. This is your chance to tell us what you think about what's happening to this country and what you're willing to do about it. We've got a series of questions for you and the means to get your answer tens of thousands of them right under the air within seconds. We've never been able to do that before. Nobody else has ever tried it. And we'll let you know up to the minute what it is that you are telling us. Dan, in fact, we already know from preparing for tonight's broadcast that people are saying that they're mad as hell in their words, not only about the economy, but about government spending, taxes, and politicians in general. And we also know that Americans have a much lower regard for Congress than they do for the president. And many blame Congress for our economic problems. And that's Americans from every walk of life across the board. Dan? Well, we're also going to find out what you think of the president's speech tonight. No one has ever attempted to poll a national representative sample of Americans this quickly before. With a built-in system of checks and balances, we're doing this sort of on two tracks tonight, one of which includes your call-ins to us. More about that uh, a little later on. Right now, let's get to it. Here's how to reach us. This is the toll-free number to call to let us know what you think about a number of questions we have for you. It is 1-800-652-4CBS. 1-800-652-4CBS. We want to hear from as many of you as possible. You can start calling right now. There's no charge for your call to us tonight. 1-800-652-4CBS. This number is good for calls from all over the United States except for the Pacific time zone. Many of the folks on the West Coast have already started calling in to take part in tonight's broadcast. So it applies to everybody right at this hour, except those on the Pacific, uh, in the Pacific time zone. So all your calls end up in Omaha, Nebraska. That's where the calls are taken. And our old friend Charles Corralt is in Omaha tonight to keep tabs on things. Charles, we know in live television anything can happen and sometimes does, but how is all this supposed to work? I have no idea how it how it's going to work, uh, Dan. I, it has to do with computers. I'm sure of that. I do know that in all the world there isn't any other room that can do what this room in Omaha can do. Call Interactive can accept and process thousands of telephone calls a minute, hundreds of thousands of calls an hour. Don't ask me how they do it. They just do it. So you who call really should not hear a busy signal if you call us tonight. What you will hear when you call is my voice, tape recorded, asking you a group of questions, maybe questions about taxes or jobs or the economy, maybe about um, education or health care, maybe about Governor Clinton or President Bush. What we ask you to do is listen carefully, answer as quickly as you can by pressing the buttons on your touch-tone phone. If you have a rotary dial on your phone or 
If you still make phone calls by cranking the old Magneto and talking to Sally, the operator, you can't take part in this, I'm sorry to say. We are running a strictly uh, touch-tone, high-tech uh, poll here. If you think of Omaha, by the way, as mainly a meatpacking and coal storage city, you're behind the times. Omaha, Nebraska, has become the high-tech communications center of America, and only here could we register so many American opinions so quickly and accurately. We can still pick up the phone and talk to you in person, and we're going to do that, too, from time to time as we go along. So let us hear from you. Every red dot on this map here behind me will represent a thousand calls coming in. And Dan, as you can see from the west, they are beginning to come in already. Charles, thanks. Let's move along with the first question that we're asking tonight. This is one of several questions we're asking of each and every person who does call in. The question is, today, are you better off than you were four years ago? Again, today, are you better off than you were four years ago? One of several questions we'll be asking through the night. In just a few minutes, we'll see what you have to say about that. And Dan, as this night goes on, I expect we'll hear from many people whose lives have been touched by this recession in one way or another. Last month, we read a remarkable letter that appeared in the Los Angeles Times. It was written anonymously. We thought it might strike a chord with you, too. So with the Times' help, we found the woman who wrote it. She agreed to share her story with us. She asked only that her name be withheld. After battling bill collectors all day, I sat down one, one night after my kids were asleep, and I worked until about 3 in the morning just summarizing what the year had been like. This was the year my children did not go to the circus, or the museum, or the movies, or McDonald's. The year their only new clothes came from charity. The year my toddler cried from hunger all day because he was tired of the only food I could offer, oatmeal. The year I asked my church on four occasions to give meals to my children. This was the year I lost 25 pounds without even trying. I was born and brought up in the middle class here in Southern California. In 1989, I went on long-term disability leave from my job as yes. an in-house business writer. In 1990, my husband's business failed. For three years, we have lived below, way below, the poverty line. We've been luckier than many people. It's taken us a while to hit bottom. We had savings credit, possessions to sell, relatives and friends to borrow from. But here we are, an inch away from foreclosure. No insurance, browbeaten by collection agents. They say we're deadbeats. We feel like deadbeats. In my whole life, I've bought only one car, a compact, and one home, a modest condominium. I've learned that the bank will foreclose on your house if you miss three payments. They will sell it for the value of the mortgage. And as I have been told by my bank, you and your family will simply have to find some other place to live, like maybe a cardboard box. I thought I was well informed, but I was not at all prepared for the violent, demoralizing effect of poverty. I had no idea how it would feel to have no food in the house, no gas, to drive to buy food, no money to buy gas, and no prospect of money. My husband and I believe we'll pull out of this. So far, though, the piecemeal work we find pays poorly. And we could paper the walls with form letters telling us either that we didn't get the job or that legal action will commence if we don't pay some debt or other. I have a dread in my bones that the worst is not yet over and that when it finally is over, it will never be altogether in the past for any one of us. She told her story so simply but powerfully. Fortunately, Dan, this story does have a happy ending, and it's typical of what's happening around the country. Donations of food and cash from total strangers poured in from people who have been in similar situations and found their way out. The letter also brought the author some part-time writing work and two customers for her husband who now sells insurance. She says their personal recession is over. And let's hope it stays that way for them, Connie. Right now, let's look at how the calls are coming in so far and answer to our first question. Yes, with this instant tallying, we can do that for you. The question, are you better off now than four years ago? In the left-hand column, you see the number of calls we've received, 
29% of Americans say yes, they're better off than they were four years ago. 52% say they are worse off. And those who say the same, riding along at 19%. It be interesting to see, Connie and Charles, whether those uh, figures hold as the evening goes along. Right now, let's pop back out to Omaha and Charlie Corral. Dan, more than uh, 30,000 people have called us already to register an opinion. Uh, let us uh, reach into this flow of numbers and percentages and hear a human voice. Uh, on the line with us is Ray Falcone, 37 years old, of uh, Millbrae, California. Uh, Mr. Falcone, did you hear anything uh, encouraging for you and anything President Bush or Speaker Foley said tonight? Well, uh, I was rather disappointed in Bush's um, uh, speech. I really think that he uh, avoided the real problems, touching on the real problems, uh, dealing with the homeless in our country. Uh, for, again, he put us on hold concerning health care. And I think he put too much emphasis again on capital gains, which seems to be too lopsided uh, an issue here. What do you do for a living, Mr. Falcone? I'm a computer consultant. I work with different companies uh, putting computers uh, in and advising them how to get the most out of them. Are, are you, do you have any fears uh, for your own job? Uh, so many people are losing theirs. Well, the nature of my own work has changed considerably. We have gone, have gone from uh, a lot of emphasis on sales and putting new equipment uh, on site to now supporting the equipment that people do have and trying to get the most out of the equipment that they have existing. As for my own employment, it hasn't gone off too much, but I think that's because a lot of people who were in-house consultants or experts have been laid yeah. off and now they're looking outside. Thank you, Mr. Falcone. You have uh, led us to the, I think, to the second question we are going to ask people tonight. We are actually asking people on the phone tonight. Connie? That's right, Charles. The second question that we are asking people is, are you worried that you or someone in your immediate family will lose his or her job this year. Again, are you worried that you or someone in your immediate family will lose his or her job this year? We want to know what you think. When we come back, your health and your health insurance, what are you willing to do to protect it? We'll be taking you to a family in New Hampshire. As Nancy Walt saves for her son's education, her savings and those of millions like her are invested in business. When business grows, our nation prospers and becomes more competitive in the world, which could open up a world of opportunities. And who will be there seeking out those opportunities for you and Nancy Walsh? Merrill Lynch. We're bullish on the future. missing. Today's pork. What's missing? 31% of the fat, 14% of the calories. Taste what you could be missing. Pork, the other white meat. Campbell's heard your healthy requests. Low fat. Less salt. But lots of taste. Here's our answer. New Campbell's healthy request ready to serve soups. All the great taste you want without some things you don't. New Campbell's healthy request. And healthy. Personnel, please. Seventh floor. Now, when life turns up the heat, there's Degree Antiperspirant. Because it's body heat activated, Degree turns on extra protection when you really need it. Degree, your body heat turns it on. Imprisoned by sinus pain, trapped by sinus pressure. It takes the power of Sanyatab to release the pressure and stop the pain. That's something Sanyatab's done for more people for more years than any other sinus medicine. Sanyatab, relief for prisoners of sinus pain. Take a look every night at the issues that affect you every day. Eye on America, only on the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather. Just who is Anita Hill, besides the woman who accused Clarence Thomas of sexual harassment? Find out Sunday on 60 Minutes. 
Thursday, a diver is trapped beneath 40 tons of steel. If it swayed or teetered, this guy would literally be ripped in half. A cop is only lifeline. Top cops. As mentioned, we have that special computerized map that shows us where your calls are coming from, and it is clearly showing that we are, as we had hoped, getting calls from all over the country. Let's go back now to Omaha, Nebraska, and Charles Corral, Charlie. Dan, as you know, American business is downsizing. That's the popular word for it. About 2,000 jobs are being eliminated in this country every day. Maybe good for the companies, but it has workers on edge. We are asking uh, our viewers tonight whether they're worried about their own jobs uh, or worried ab about the jobs of anybody uh, in their family. And uh, shortly now, we're going to uh, have our first compilation of, uh, of what they are uh, telling us. Uh, one of our callers tonight is Lynn Foster from uh, New Orleans, a 39-year-old uh, travel agent. Uh, Lynn Foster, what was your reaction to the speeches you heard tonight? Well, I thought that the um, president was just responding to um, the allegations that he hasn't done enough for the American people. I didn't believe that he was really sincere, and that was my overall judgment. All right, thank you, Ms. Foster. Uh, what about uh, this question of, uh, of whether people are worried about their jobs? When we asked about that, as we are doing so tonight, uh, a whopping 63% of Americans say, indeed, they are worried about losing their jobs this year. We may all hope that those are unfounded fears because a 63% job loss in a single year would be the deepest of uh, depressions, of course. Connie? Thank you, Charles. Let's take another look at the question we'll be tracking throughout the evening. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? Once again, are you better off now than you were four years ago? Better off, 29%. Worse off, 53%. The same, 18%. It's important to note here that this is quite dramatic. It's very different from just about a month ago. CBS News conducted a poll, and it showed dramatically different results. Worse off was about 30 percent. Dan, it's gone up to 53 percent. Perhaps the group that's calling us now, these across the country, are, are quite upset, quite angry. This does not bode well for President Bush on the night of his State of the Union. Well, there's a ways to go, and of course this is just one measure. I think we need to point out right now that to help guard against possible manipulation, we do have a system of checks and balances of sorts in place this evening. It lets us know how your calls from all over the nation compare with, as Connie pointed out, this scientifically selected cross-section of Americans chosen by our regular CBS News polling unit. Now that's ours is the oldest and most experienced network polling unit in broadcast news. And the Americans in the scientifically selected sample also are on the line with us tonight. They've been calling in. And we'll see how our CBS News poll compares with what you at home are telling us. Now, on the question, are you better off than you were four years ago? The scientifically selected sample gives us the following reading. It says, better off, 24%, worse off, 32%, about the same, 44%. So note that what those who are telephoning us tonight, calling in on the 800 number, seem to be angrier and more concerned about where the economy is and where it may be headed than those in the scientifically selected sample that constitute our regular CBS News poll. Now, when you really listen to people out there, it's clear, whether you're talking about a telephone poll or a scientifically selected sample, that health care remains at the top of the list of concerns people have during this recession. A year and a half ago, Jim Fuller of Seabrook, New Hampshire, lost his $30,000 a year job as a house painter. At the same time, he lost his health insurance. Then, one of the worst things happened. He got sick, so sick that he told the emergency room doctor he could not afford to be treated even though he might die. That morning I woke up suffering from shortness of breath. I, I mean, I couldn't walk down the hallway without you know, being shot of breath. So I ended up in the emergency room. My wife brought me in. He had blood clots in his lungs. He wanted to leave. He couldn't afford to stay regardless of the repercussions. Um, and my response to that was sort of the opposite in that uh, he couldn't. 
can afford to leave. Let's hold this mask right over your nose. While in the hospital, Dr. Stephen Bodwin found that Jim Fuller suffers from yet another life-threatening and costly condition. In fact, he needs a special respirator to keep him breathing while asleep. The cost of the machine is $1,100, but, you know, when you don't have your money to pay your rent, you don't have money to buy, buy a machine. Right now, there is no insurance. Um, where I work, I couldn't afford to put the whole family on it because I was the only one that was bringing money home. Donna brings home about $250 each week. Health care benefits would take $75 out of that, leaving them with too little to live on. You get on that little slide and you're going down and down. Christ, you think you hit bottom. I think they open up another trap door. It's got to get better. <laughs> Sometime. Someday. Off and wonder why me, huh? <laughs> We're out of here. Jim Fuller left the hospital two weeks ago, owing thousands of dollars in doctor's fees and laboratory tests. Ah, the outside. And not knowing whether he will need a kidney operation. I had a prosperous business for a few years. But when things fell out, they fell out big time. Thanks a lot. Well, this is already a collection agency. Oh, Never overdo medical bill. And I just feel like a very guilty person who doesn't, you know, who's not able to pay her bills anymore. This is a life and death thing, and at first it's a hard thing to grasp. But when you have all them hours to think, and you go over and over things, it's like, wow, you know, life is too short to go through it sick. I know right. we're going to make it. One way or the other, we'll make it. But the sad fact is February 1st is just around the corner, and uh, I don't know what to tell my landlord, you know. I have no income. My doctor says I'm not able to work anymore, so I don't know what the next avenue is. Jim Fuller is with us tonight from his home in Seabrook, New Hampshire. Jim, how are you doing now? Uh, I'm, I'm doing a little better. I got some more bad news today. My... Uh, the hopes for my machine to be paid for by uh, Medicare uh, fell through. Medicare doesn't kick in for two years, and I'm, my wife is told that she makes too much money for Medicaid, so today wasn't a good day for me. But uh, I'm feeling better. I'm trying. I'm going to get through. And what did you think of the president's address tonight? Uh, I wasn't too pleased with the man. I, he said a lot, but he didn't say much. Did you vote I for mean, him last time? No, I did not, and I surely won't vote for him this time either. You know, the man tried to tell the, the world has a problem, but months ago when we needed him for an unemployment extension, New Hampshire didn't have a problem. He didn't have a problem sitting in his office, but we sure did here. And now that he needs our votes, he's dumping money into our state, which isn't doing anything other than upsetting more people, you know. I don't think anybody believes the man. His promises were fake four years ago, and I don't think he'll do anything for us again. Jim Fuller, about your illness, God bless you. Good luck. We hope things start getting better for you. Thank you, sir. Connie? Here is a health care question that we are asking tonight with an eye towards solving this problem. Would you be willing to pay more taxes, up to $1,000 a year, if the federal government paid for free health care for everyone? Once again, would you be willing to pay more taxes, up to $1,000 a year, if the federal government paid for free health care for everyone? Give us a call and tell us what you think. Dan? When we come back, we'll tell you what you've been telling us about health care, and later some questions about whether you believe the press, the media, including CBS, Connie, Dan, rather than Charles Corralt, are all part of the nation's economic problem. Before we go away, let's give you the number to call again. America on the line. We're listening to America. 1-800-652-4CBS. 1-800-652-4CBS. Call us and stick here with us.
the storm, it's only natural to wonder where the future will lead. To people who worry about the winds of change today, we'd like to remind you that no adversity lasts forever. And we'll be there with the strength and resources you can count on. Because at Merrill Lynch, we're bullish on the future. And toast with butter, sir. Oh, miss, do you have filling? Mm. just the taste. Philly cream cheese also has ounce for ounce half the calories of butter or margarine. Next time, butter your bread with Philly instead. Uh, uh, um, um, uh. EPT, the most trusted name in home pregnancy test, works in just minutes. But the baby. EPT, the fast, easy way to get the big news. Cool. <laughs> if this is a cold. Mediflu, maximum strength relief in a convenient caplet. For more than a cold, for the flu, Mediflu. Our dentist recommended baking soda. But we wanted tartar control. Arm & Hammer Dental Care gives us both. Now Arm & Hammer Dental Care just introduced the only tartar control toothpaste with baking soda. And brushing with baking soda... Or baking soda toothpaste... <laughs> ...is recommended by two out of three dentists to help provide healthy teeth and gums. Only Arm & Hammer Dental Care gives us the tartar control we want... ...and the baking soda our dentist recommends. New Arm & Hammer Dental Care tartar control. From the baking soda experts. Monday night is the reason why... Wait a minute. If you love CBS Monday comedies, look what we've got for you Wednesday night. Whammo! Try the Emmy Award-winning Davis Rules. Then, the Golden Globe Award winner for Best Comedy Series, Brooklyn Bridge. All those who love great comedies, say hi! Tequila and Bonetti are cops with an attitude. Watch this mutt kick butt. Now I'm ready for anything. Tequila and Bonetti, Friday. You're on TV8. Iowa's news leader. Well, to say the switchboards are lighting up is a vast overstatement. Frankly, this new unique system we put together is being virtually overwhelmed with calls. If you're calling us and you can't get through, know that we're just simply being overwhelmed. If you happen to get a busy signal and you keep getting a busy signal, we'll wait a little while and try later on. We appreciate you calling in. Remember, this is something new. We've never tried it before. Nobody else ever has. Our third question being asked to people who do get through is about what you would be willing to do to help solve the health care and health insurance crisis. Would you pay more taxes for free health care? So far, with the number of calls registered on the left-hand side under the red lines, so far, 54% of those calling in say, yes, they'd be willing to pay more taxes uh, for a national health care plan. 46% uh, say no. Connie, there's no question that the most talked about group in the country this year is the entire economic middle class, whether you're talking about health care or anything else. And no politician these days tries to get elected county commissioner or cat collector <laughs> unless he can make a passionate appeal to the middle class. So whether blue collar or white collar, people say they are middle class by wide margins. 80% of Americans say they're middle class, no matter where they live, what they make, or what they do. So here's another question we're asking tonight. Do you think President Bush understands the problems of the middle class? Once again, do you think President Bush understands the problems of the middle class? Now let's go back to Omaha and Charles. We have uh, Ray Regan Taylor of Atlanta, Georgia on the line with us, one of our callers, uh, Connie. Mr. Taylor, uh, how old are you? 24. And what's your job? Uh, I'm a trucking operator. Are, are you um, worried about uh, losing your job? Many people we've talked to tonight seem to be. Well, yes, quite frankly, I'm worried about losing my job and my whole company going under. Um, did you hear anything, uh, either in President Bush's speech or in Speaker Foley's uh, response, uh, Mr. Taylor, that uh, cheered you up at all? <laughs> Frankly, I really didn't hear anything that provided much hope for me that I could see immediately, or even within the next four years. Thank you for talking with us. Well, we've been hearing an awful lot of, uh, 
of gloomy talk tonight. There is an awful lot out there in the country. We've been hearing about problems. But uh, Connie and Dan, I've, I suppose we ought to remember that Americans have lived through far worse times than this before. And uh, uh, as the president suggested, historically, we're pretty good at finding solutions. Um, here in Nebraska, telecommunications, symbolized by this call interactive control room, has been a, a solution. Unemployment in Nebraska is under 3%. That's less than half the national average. And some of the old traditional industries are finding solutions, too. Do you think a steel mill can survive in America today? We found one in Birmingham, Alabama, that thinks it can. Taxi put downtown. Some of my background is in guerrilla warfare and special forces Green Beret training. And I think the business world, to some aspect, can be guerrilla warfare. Maybe Phil Casey is what American businesses need, a Green Beret for chief financial officer. Jim Todd, the chief executive of Birmingham Steel, is just as tough. We are a very uh, aggressive, well-managed, non-union steel company uh, that has been able to acquire and run uh, old steel mills uh, at a very low cost. Workers settle for low salaries, knowing they'll get big bonuses if they work hard enough. I enjoy working here. It, it's a very good job. It's demanding, but it, it pays well. If they get hurt on the job, uh, they don't get incentive. And if you miss for any reason then a day during the week, you don't get any incentive for the week. The only excuse is a death in the family. Everybody pulls their weight around here. If they don't, then they, they're just not going to make it. Everybody pulls his weight, including the bosses. Phil Casey, you don't have in-house legal counsel. You don't have public relations. You don't have finance experts. Welcome to Dow Phone's free headline. We don't have any company cars. Our corporate jet today is Delta or American or U.S. Air or whoever flies out of Birmingham. Thank you, sir. Well, if we can see our shares trade. We Jim to... Todd isn't working for nothing. His base salary is $400,000 a year. Phil Casey's is 215000 Just like the workers, they can make more. In a good year, I do terrifically well. And in a, in a, in a bad year, I do terrifically well, too. Uh, but uh, there's a whole lot more compensation for everybody in a good year. This is a good year at Birmingham Steel, a company as lean and tough and hard as the product it makes. No frills, all steel. And the more steel, the better for everybody. So the news from American industry isn't all bad, uh, Dan. And as you say, some people say the national gloom is... Uh, our fault, because we never report any good news. My own mother used to say that all the time. <laughs> well, a lot of people's mothers do say it, Charles, and that's one reason we're taking up that issue. It's one of the questions that we've been asking people who called in to us tonight. The question involves us, the press, including television. Does the press, the media, exaggerate how bad economic conditions are? Does the media exaggerate how bad things are? Again, the Connie, that I think as we begin to see public reaction to this, it may not be altogether good news for us. If President Bush thinks he's getting some bad news, we may be in for some ourselves right. here. We're prepared to take it, though. <laughs> we'll be back with some more questions, and the answers we'll be getting from you in just a moment. Stay with us. Because there's a man planning his retirement. Because there's a family hoping to send their kids to college. Because every investor is different, with dreams all their own, Dean Witter measures success one investor at a time. When life turns up the heat. Hello? Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Jeff Green. There's Degree Antiperspirant. Degree's body heat activated. One more minute. To release extra protection. Jeff? Hi. Degree, your body heat turns it on. What's the worst part of treating your worst colds? A cold medicine that leaves me spacey. Well, it's the cold medicine that can zonk me out. I hate that. It's like I'm off in the ozone somewhere. Groggy, spacey. Introducing Sudafed Severe Cold Formula. If it could help stop the cough and the fever, but not stop me from getting to work, that'd be great. 
first Sudafed cough, cold, and flu tablet, and it has nothing but maximum strength ingredients? All that and it won't knock me out? Perfect. New Sudafed Severe Cold Formula. Maximum strength without drowsiness. America on the Line will continue. This is CBS. Good evening. Sue Mason, TV8 Newsbreak. President Bush addressed the nation tonight. In his State of the Union address, the president focused on remedies for the recession. He urged lawmakers to eliminate more than 200 federal programs he described as wasteful. A live report from Washington tonight with reaction to the president's speech. Also tonight, what you can do to cut down on your grocery bill. That's tonight's Making Ends Meet. And an eye on health with a new and, laser uh, treatment that can erase birthmarks that were once permanent. Now this. Inside Edition is so real you can feel it. Bill O'Reilly, Experience Network Anchor. We go in, we get the story, we get the truth. That's why we're here. Bill O'Reilly, Inside Edition. Late night at 12.05 here on TV8. Join us at 10. Roast beef is slow roasted in this kitchen every day. I watch that oven till the beef is done just perfect. Right now, I'll give you Hardy's hot roast beef sandwich with our original crispy curls for just $1.99. Are you ready for some real food? Hardy's. Making ends meet at town meeting Thursday, January 30th at 7. America on the Line continues. From New York, here again is Dan Rather. Good evening again, and welcome back to America on the Line. And we're listening to America, and we've been hearing some very interesting things from you tonight. By the way, AT&T estimates that over 7 million people have attempted to reach us so far in this program. Phone calls, over 7 million attempts so far. Now, for those who got through, and we recognize a lot of you have been trying to get through and couldn't make it, to our question about whether President Bush understands the problems of the middle class, the calls coming in from all of those places. Uh, do you think the president understands the problems of the middle class? 32%? Yes, he does. 68%? No. Nobody's seen figures like that, I don't think, Conti, since the time of the uh, Carter presidency. Yes, his uh, approval rating has been extremely low, dropping from, what, 88% down to 43%, according to our last CBS News poll. So it probably doesn't surprise anyone that, uh, that our viewers calling in do not believe that he understands the problems of the middle class. Now, here's the answer to our question about the media. Is the media exaggerating how bad economic conditions are? Yes, they exaggerate 39%. No, things are as bad as they report, 61%. Now, that's a surprise. Uh, usually, the media ranks in terms of credibility behind the president and Congress. In this particular case, uh, the public is telling us tonight that uh, we may have done the proper thing. We have uh, All reported those relatives accurately. you told to call in got through. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I think we, uh, we did well tonight, but not for long, I'm sure. Well, interesting to note that it, it, when you ask that question about the press, yeah. it generally is directly tied to the issue. That is, if you ask during the war, you might have got a different response. Uh, well, yes. the representative sample of Americans in our more standard, regular kind of CBS News poll, this is uh, their, what they say about uh, does the media exaggerate economic conditions. 35%, uh, yes they do, 65%, no, things aren't as bad as are reported. So it's the regular CBS News poll in, that, in this case runs almost identical to what America on the Line is telling right, us in this program. Our scientific cross-section matches the viewers that are calling in tonight. Let's go back out to Omaha and Charles Garreau. Thanks, Dan. These percentages are uh, interesting, uh, all right. Let's hear from uh, another living, breathing human being for a second. Uh, on the line with us is uh, Bill Emmons of Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, good evening to you, Mr. Emmons. Uh, what reaction did you have to President Bush's big speech tonight? I liked his speech. Um, I liked it because uh, he tried to inspire the American public and uh, 
He's trying to draw the country together to do something about our situation. And I think we should give him the one-line veto to get rid of some of the bickering on Capitol Hill. You think that would do it, uh, if he could just selectively veto things he doesn't like rather than having to kill a whole bill? Well, yeah, I'll get rid of some of the needless things that are tacked on to bills as they go through. Thanks very much, Mr. Evans. Uh, thank you for joining us. Connie? Thank you, Charles. The story that's been grabbing all the headlines, maybe too many headlines, in the last 48 hours has been the controversy over Governor and Democratic presidential candidate Bill Clinton's alleged extramarital affairs. That prompts another question we've been asking tonight. Are you satisfied with Governor Bill Clinton's explanation about his personal life? Once again, are you satisfied with Governor Bill Clinton's explanation about his personal life? Connor, do we ever know that a lot of people are upset?